Hey guys, it's Miss Thurston. I wanted to make a very short video about the Spanish colonies that were established in the Western world um, right after the Age of Exploration got underway because Spain was really the first European country to really make their mark on the North American and South American continent. Uh, they were the ones that really um, led the way and established the first thriving colonies. Well, not so much the first thriving colonies, but the ones that really made their mark. But they made their mark um, first in the Central American and South American regions. And their impact in those areas um, were felt even up into what we now call um, the North American continent and of course um, North Carolina because of what they did to the Native American um, and the populations that were already there. And it wasn't because of the explorers, it was because of a group of people that came after the explorers, the people that wanted to see what there, um, to see what was there, um, by a group of um, people called the conquistadors, and they weren't the people that maybe you've seen in the movies um, that these the movies made these men out to be. So. Um, if you've got your notes in front of you, I want you to just take some notes quickly and we're going to try to answer the essential, essential question. What sort of impact did the Spanish colonization and the Spanish exploration have on the North and South American continent and to the native peoples of these regions? So our essential question is, what effects did Spanish exploration and colonization have on the New World? And we know that it was a it was a lasting impact from the language that they still speak today to just their the names and things like that. So please take some detailed notes as we go through this. So we need to talk about two groups of men that came over during this time um, and some notable figures. The difference between a conquistador and an explorer. Um, both conquistadors and explorers sailed under the Spanish crown or for the um, Spanish kings and queens at that time. But unlike explorers, conquistadors were in search or spreading or finding the, what we called the three G's. And we talked about these um, um, under our last unit. The first G was, of course, God to convert people to Catholicism. The second was to acquire gold. And the third, the third G was glory. So God, gold, and glory, the influence or power. And but unlike a, um, unlike a conquistador, an explorer just what could come from any nation. And that's how you had um, explorers from many different regions. And explorers who came under the Spanish crown would, wanted to explore new lands. They wanted to claim new lands for their country, even if they didn't necessarily sail for the Spanish crown. They wanted to achieve fame or fortune. Um, and a lot of them did this for scientific research because with their new scientific tools like cartographers and the abolave, they were able they were able to map the earth so much better and so that scientific research said hey we can learn so much more about our earth let's go ahead and you know explore so an explorer had more altruistic purposes where a conquistador may not have such altruistic purposes um, so we've already talked about this guy, Christopher Columbus, so we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on him. Remember, Christopher Columbus was from Italy, so he was an Italian, but he sailed for Spain. And while it's possible um, 
well, it's possible non-Indigenous people had been to the New World. It was Columbus's voyage that ignited the Age of Discovery. So while Europeans, yes, had been to the New World, um, his voyage sparked um, a flurry of other exploration. So that's why he's given a lot of credit for quote unquote, discovering the new world. And so he's considered an explorer because that was his only purpose was to kind of explore and discover these various routes. Um, Juan Ponce de Leon was, um, he sailed with Columbus on his second expedition um, to the North and um, South American continents in 1493. He was famous for, according to some, discovering the Fountain of Youth. Now, this was not a verified account. Um, this was very much legend. Um, he was the first European to reach what we consider today Florida. So you're going to see a lot of um, tributes to Juan Ponce de Leon down in Florida with a lot of streets and things like that and neighborhoods named for Juan Ponce de Leon. Um, and he is considered a conquistador because he was in search of one of the three G's. He was in search of fame and glory um, rather than just exploring um, new lands. So unlike Columbus, who was just looking and exploring, he is considered a conquistador because he really wanted um, that fame and glory attached to his name. Another famous Spanish explorer was Vasco Nunes um, de Balboa, and he was the first to see the specific, um, according to legend, um, the first European to see the Pacific Ocean um, when he crossed what is now considered Panama. So if you look at a map and you look at the area that is considered Central America, there is a very thin strip of land that is the country of Panama. And once he crossed that strip of land, the next ocean he encountered was what we call the Pacific Ocean. And that um, honor goes to um, De Baboa. So he claimed the ocean and all of its shores for Spain because, you know, they did that back then. Um, you can claim entire oceans for Spain. And he went on exploring all of the Western coast of South America and claiming it all for Spain. Um, that is why a lot of the South American countries it speak Spanish. And he is considered a conquistador because again, he was doing that for glory and fame for Spain. Um, Francisco Pizarro, we did speak a little bit on already. He is best known for leading the defeat of the Incan, Incan Empire um, in 1535. Now, you cannot talk about Francisco Pizarro without talking about um, just how horrible he was to the, the Incas in, during his expeditions. A lot of his treatment of the Native Americans um, and the Native peoples in Central America um, can be attributed to um, Pizarro's leadership. Pizarro saw these people as not as peoples to be dominated and in his way of claiming these lands and riches for the Spanish empire. So he was not a nice guy. He absolutely said, this land is for Spain and I am its ruler, get out of my way. And so he was, he was just horrible to these people, um, enslaving them and just, not making a very good impression um, on the Incas and the other native tribes that he encountered um, 
well, in the name of Spain. Um, so he is best known. And in 1513, he was originally a member of um, De Balboa's expedition that discovered the, the Pacific Ocean. And because he was um, just absolutely in it for fame and glory and not being nice about it, of course, that made him a conquistador. Um, Francisco Vasquez um, de Coronado is who we can uh, contribute to making more of his mark up into the North American continent. He was in search of that legendary myth of El Dorado, um, the seven cities of gold, where just buildings and stacks of gold um, were and riches were awaiting. But again, absolutely, it was just a myth. His search led him to become the first European to see the Grand Canyon and the Colorado River. So again, that is why a large portion of the South is um, contributing, is the large portion of the Southern United States um, in is Spanish speaking because Spain um, claimed a lot of that area. Um, and of course that makes um, De Coronado a conquistador because he claimed it in search of riches that that other G gold. Hernan Cortez, much, <laughs> much like some of his predecessors, um, he is known for conquering the Aztec Empire and not being nice to the native peoples. Um, he is the first conquistador, however, to be given a hacienda, and he is considered a conquistador. Um, Cortez had an even more infamous um, how, how should I put this um, legend to back him up. The Aztecs had a myth, um, a myth that, or excuse me, a legend in their religion about a pale um, God with a white beard that would come and be their salvation. So when they saw this pale skinned European coming with this older gentleman with a white beard come, that was how he was able to come and infiltrate the Aztec empire um, so easily um, because he came and at first they saw him as this fulfillment of this old Aztec legend. And when he just came and was the absolute anesthetist of this legend, he absolutely decimated the entire Aztec empire. And so it was absolutely horrible for Amon Cortez to take this um, legend and turn it around on the Aztec people who initially did nothing but welcome him. And so it was devastating. But um, other besides that, he is the first conquistador to be given what is called a hacienda. And a hacienda is a developed into this hierarchical hierarchical system that we're going to explain in just a second. So the Hacienda system is a large land grant system given to a conquistador by the Spanish crown. And so when he um, was given this large parcel of land in what is present day Mexico, um, he was given it to him as a reward for conquering the Aztecs in the name of the Spanish crown. And when you are given a hacienda um, and granted this large parcel of land, you become a patron um, as the head of the, the hacienda. And it Again, it's males. Males are the head of the patron. Your patron, um, the head of your hacienda. And um, it's a system 
of land ownership and estates throughout the Spanish colonies, much like you would see the plantation system in the southern United States um, back in the day. Um, it was passed down from male, from the males um, through a family line. So you're going to see a lot of parallels in that. So the encomendia, so I think that's how you pronounce it, the encomendia um, is the name of the system that provides the labor for the hacienda. It's very similar to that of a caste system. The encomendia was a group of people that lived on the land which had been granted to a conquistador via the hacienda. And it was the duty of the patron to provide compensation and protection to the people as well as convert those in their encomendia to Christianity. However, in many cases that did not happen because remember, many of these native peoples practice their own native religions. And many of these were native peoples that pr practiced ancient religions um, of their native, um, the Inca, the Aztecs and those um, native religions. So some of them did not convert, even though it was the Patron's responsibility to convert them to Christianity. Um, the Incomindia hierarchy had four distinct classes of people. The highest class made up of the Peninsulares. Uh, the Peninsular was someone who had 100% Spanish blood and was born in Spain. That, this meant that they were in control. The second class consisted of the Creoles, and the Creoles had 100% Spanish blood, even though they weren't necessarily born in Spain. It almost meant like they were second generation. Um, they did not have the highest uh, status, but it would still be possible for them to inherit the land if their parents were the Peninsulares. So it was very important for them to marry other peninsulares in order to keep the, the line and the Spanish blood pure. Um, the third class consisted of gro two groups of people, the mesitos and the mulatos. They each had some Spanish blood in them, and these were mainly located in small communities and villages. And these were considered the working class people. These were your tradesmen, your shop owners, those kinds of people. And the mes the mesitos um, had both Spanish and Native American blood in them and the mulattoes had both Spanish and African slave blood. So it wasn't just the white Europeans who had um, slaves. These were also, don't, don't forget that the Spanish also had um, African slaves. Um, and so the lowest of the class system were the captured Aztecs and Native Americans who were, and also the um, African slaves. Um, they had very minimal rights, but this was also your largest group of people. So in order to minimize the likelihood of rebellion, um, they were provided with food and supplies and shelter because they figured, hey, if we make sure that all of these people are happy, they're not going to rise up against us because uh, we are sorely outnumbered. And if these people ever get it into their heads that they're to rise up and revolt against us, we are outnumbered. And that's what eventually did happen, but that's years down the road. So let's go back to our central question. What effects did Spanish exploration and colonization have on the new world? You should be able to think, okay, the Spanish came and conquered much of Central America um, and 
parts of North America and South America and explored. What happened to large groups of people? What happened? What systems did they set up? Um, what happened um, after they set up these systems? So as you go back through and think about that and look at your notes, you should be able to really answer this question. And when you answer this question, um, be prepared to discuss this in class, especially in your small groups, because you never know when this might show up on a little quizzy quiz. Okay. Bye, guys.